when we celebrate a major feast, like the Feast of Christ the King, I always like looking up what the history of that feast is, and, that, and that's a good thing to do. Um, I commend it to you. <clears throat> now, what, what you may know or you may not know, that the Feast of Christ the King has been celebrated in the church for less than a century. Pope Pius XI instituted the Feast of Christ the King in 2025. Now, Pope Pius was born in 1857. So he had lived through the horrors of World War I. <clears throat> and then when he became Pope in 1922, he saw that Europe was going back to the state that the way of things were that started that same terrible war. He feared more war coming. But he, and he also witnessed the rise of non-Christian dictatorships in Europe. He saw Catholics being taken in by these earthly leaders. Also, these dictators often attempted to assert authority over the church. And many Catholics and Christians had begun to doubt Christ's authority and existence, as well as the church's power to continue Christ's authority. It was a dark time. And Pius instituted this feast to lift up Christ as king, to protect the church, but to protect humanity. But he had, he had three specific reasons which he enumerated in, in his um, epistle that he sent out. The first is that um, leaders and nations would see that they are bound to give respect to Christ. Well, we see now that's what the second was that nations would see that the church has the right to freedom, which is something our nation has seen for over 200 and some odd years, and immunity from the state. I don't think he was thinking the church could freely uh, break the laws of whatever country they were in, but anyway. But the third one, probably the most important, that the faithful would gain strength and courage from the celebration of the feast as we are reminded that Christ must reign in our hearts, our minds, our wills, and bodies. So, indeed, this feast was instituted in a time of hostility towards the church and faltering faith in Christ. Now, I, I want to look up and see where exactly in the New Testament Christ was proclaimed king. He is called Lord throughout, of course. But king, that's a little different because Lord is like just basically someone who has a higher status than you. But king, that's a real political statement. And of course we have in our reading in Colossians that he was rescued from the power of the darkness and transformed us into the kingdom of his beloved son. Now that kind of indirectly, doesn't say directly that Christ is king. He probably is king in, in his kingdom, but the son is also under a father. <clears throat> But in Timothy, 1 Timothy and in Revelations are where we have the, the clear decoration of Christ as king. And again, these are some of the last um, books written in the New Testament in our Holy Scriptures. And especially, so you can imagine that when they were written, it was probably at least two generations after the death of Christ. And Jesus hasn't come back yet. And people were going, 
Right. It's been this long. He hasn't come back yet. You know, why not? Maybe, maybe it's not true. And Christians, as they did that time, were living under persecution, sometimes worse than others. And so what Timothy was trying to say was, yes, he is still Lord of, he's still our only sovereign. He is the King of kings and Lords of lords. Believe in him, trust in him, follow him. And in Revelation, like three times, he is called the King of the nation, Lord of lords and kings of kings. And then he is described as King of kings and Lord of lords. So Revelation is making very clear that he is the sovereign. And that all things will be put under his feet and under his rule. Now, we know that now that Revelation was written in a time of great persecution of the church, horrific. And it was written as a protest against the emperor of Rome. It was written to encourage the faithful, the churches, the Christians to continue to believe, to trust, and follow Christ. And you know, we do, all of us today, all Christians throughout, need assurance that Christ is indeed lifted up on high and is the ultimate power in the universe, especially in dark times and hard times. We need to know that in the end, Love wins. Now the terrible and tragic fact is that Jesus being king of kings and lords of lords and the earth is his footstool and, and uh, he has conquered over all has been interpreted to mean that Christians need to conquer over all. Christians need to be over all on earth. Forgetting what Jesus said his followers were to be. They were to be servants to others. And today's lesson, all of them are a, a much needed corrective for this. You know, like Jeremiah, woe to the shepherds who destroy and scatter the sheep of my pasture. I truly hear God is speaking of shepherds as the leaders of Israel who have not attended to his flock. And God promises, I will raise up shepherds over them who will shepherd them, and they shall not fear any longer or be dismayed, nor shall any be missing. And God is setting forth examples of what shepherds, leaders, are supposed to be at all levels, from the highest to the one attending over 10 or less. And then the, the other beautiful promise, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will raise up for David a righteous branch, and he shall reign as king, deal wisely, and execute justice and righteousness for the land. This is how kings and leaders are to reign, how to exercise their authority and the power of their office. And then Colossians, it's, there's a part here I, I love so much. I mean, I love this whole passage. It's beautiful. It's wonderful. It's a hymn, really. It is a hymn that was in the church at the time this was written. It says, Through him God was pleased to reconcile to himself all things. So through Christ, through Jesus, all things are reconciled to God. His kingdomship, his exalted self, his divine self, his human self, reconciled. That's what the purpose of reconciliation that he came to earth and to make peace through the blood of his cross. Now that would be the first clip there, huh? But then we get the very powerful image from our gospel. After all this um, 
what we have heard in uh, through the canticle and through Colossians of Christ lifted up and this uh, very transcendent vision, we are given the flip side, Jesus crucified. And as I was reading these um, lessons and meditating on them, in the gospel, that first sentence, when they came to the place that is called the skull, when the passion gospel narrative has, is read um, on uh, Palm Sunday or Good Friday, when they get to the place where Jesus gets to Golgotha or the skull, we all stand, having heard the lengthy narrative beforehand. We stand in respect, we stand in sorrow for our Lord, who was so shamefully treated and, and crucified. And what does Jesus do? Having been so horribly abused, mistreated, and betrayed, framed, and justly accused and sentenced. He says these words, Father, forgive them. They do not know what they are doing. It's a very powerful statement of who Jesus is, who God is, and how we are to be. And so he offers from the cross forgiveness. And then to the criminal, well, he didn't condemn the criminal who was ber berating him also, like all the others. I mean, he didn't condemn him. He didn't you know, talk back to him or whatever. The one who turned to him, he offered to him compassion and hope. So in the cross, in Christ's suffering and crucifixion, he is king. He reigns as king. And what does he give? He gives forth forgiveness, compassion, and hope. Pope Francis, in his homily for this feast, proclaimed Christ the king of mercy. I was real glad to read that. It's not the king of judgment. He's the king of mercy. And he goes on to say, the power of Christ the king is not the power as defined in this world, but the love of God. A love capable of encountering and healing all things. Now, when <clears throat> two weeks ago, the Sunday before the election, when I preached at St. Matthew and, and St. James, one of the things I said in my homily, and I'm glad I did, that whatever happens November 8th, November 9th, Jesus is still our captain. He is our one true light in darkness. I'm very glad. I preach that because I believe that, that whoever was elected, the truth of Jesus is still true. And then, after the election, I didn't feel despair because I knew Christ is still Lord. I am still following him. He still has work for me to do. I still have a purpose and meaning in my life that no one, no president, no king, no one can take from me, can take from the church, can take from us. We can continue to follow the vision of Jesus, of being good news to the poor, of setting the oppressed free, of breaking the chains that bind us, such as addiction, violence, and other uh, forms of harm and evil, like the destruction of our creation, so, 
I was thinking, okay, how can I do this now? And one of the things I do after election, I try to look and see, you know, who voted for whom, where, which that's real data compared to the polls. That's real data that you can look at and you kind of see, you know. And I, I looked at the maps and I said, oh my God, we really are divided. We really are divided. Those in blue states have not been listening, attending to the needs of the rural states. And I know full well that there is an urban and rural divide. I feel it in here in Idaho, and when I go to, to St. Matthews in Oregon, I really hear about it because they think those over in Portland don't know what's going on over here. And so there's that barrier. But Christ came to break barriers, to reach, to, dis, to bring peace and reconciliation. But how do we do that? Our bishop, uh, when he was talking to the guys, Gossison Convention, giving us convention homily, we get a longer one than what you all get. One of the things he said that I remember, and I will paraphrase this, is that if we want to like go down deep to the fears that underlie the divisions between us, which is why we have divisions, we need to go beyond our comfort zones, to reach out to those beyond our comfort zones. And that's hard work. And that's the hard work our nation needs to do. That's the hard work each one of us to do. I think here in Weezer, one place where there is division is between white and brown, the racism that is present, hidden perhaps, Maybe not so much now, I don't know, but I know there's a division there. How do we, here at St. Luke's, not reach out to them to listen, to say, we want to listen to you. We want to learn what your life is about. We want to learn what your needs are and how you think you need to fulfill them and then how you think we can help you with that. And so, in the reign of the feast of Christ the King, we need to remember our King reigns from the cross, even unto this day. He reigns in the suffering. He reigns in the vulnerable. In that, let us have hope. And let us follow his example of giving compassion, love, hope, forgiveness. Amen. Amen.